policy portfolio some more global level. Um, so we had mentioned that maybe I would give a little overview of the types of global level analyses that we're doing, but I can also touch on country level stuff if people are interested in hearing that. Um, but Kristen, would it be helpful if I give a background on ground truth or is that not necessary? I think so, yeah, if, if you wouldn't okay. mind. Thank you. Sure. So Ground Truth Solutions has been around for about a decade, and we collect perceptions of crisis affected people all over the world through quantitative and qualitative data collection studies. Um, we have ongoing programming in, I would also say, about a dozen countries. And the idea is to collect people's feedback on the humanitarian response that they're receiving and bring that back to decision makers at whatever level, whether it's organization level or the national coordination level or the global level, and to advocate for reforms based on what communities want um, and based on the recommendations that they tell us through our studies. So that's how we're kind of formatted. We have projects per country, and then I try to pull together the findings and talk about things at a more global level at, as well to push at different levels. Um, so that's the idea. In terms of what's coming up, um, and I'm happy to talk about this more in detail, but just want to flag for people in this call, and you guys can tell me what might be in, of interest to you and your work. But we've just published um, our first brief that looks at accountability to affected people and how if AAP is not done well, it can accentuate or perpetuate people's vulnerabilities. So it looks at guidance on protection and protection mainstreaming, which I know is no longer the focus and it's more COP, but it's looking more at protection mainstreaming and at AAP and how they're kind of one in the same and inherently linked and how it can be dangerous to kind of separate them into silos and think of them as separate things, but that they should very much be linked and supposed to bring also together the guidance from the IASC and the Global Protection Cluster into that brief. So if that's of interest, I'll, I'll pop that link in the chat in a moment. We are also drafting a brief on complaint and feedback mechanisms. We have data that from, I think, 15,000 people in 2000 and, uh, 22 that show that people don't know of complaint feedback mechanisms. Half of those that know use them, half of them that use them receive a response, and half of those that received a response are satisfied, which really are pretty dismal findings. And so we're drafting a brief on uh, people's perceptions of complaint feedback mechanisms and how to improve them and what their use should be, what their use case should be, since so much investment is going in them. But right now, it seems globally they're not living up to their accountability standards that they are supposed to be. Um, we're also looking into this concept of transparency. So we have questions on if uh, aid recipients know how humanitarians are using um, their funding. And we also have questions on if um, aid recipients think that decisions about humanitarian aid are done in a transparent way. So we will be drafting a blog on this concept of transparency. Um, a blog will come out in July on localization. We worked with one of our partners who helps us with, um, or who leads, I should say, our data collection in Nigeria. And it's a reflection piece that's also critical of GTS and a kind of reflection on, on GTS's work and, and ways that we need to improve um, for as a research entity on the side of localization. And we have um, a statistical approach for our studies where we look at survey respondents expectations of a certain indicator and their perceptions. To give you an example, we would ask them, is it important to you to be informed about the aid in your area? And then we would ask them a subsequent question, do you feel informed? And that gap is supposed to measure the aid delivery gap between their expectations and their reality. And so our head of data is writing a brief on that approach um, and why that's important for the humanitarian community. And that should also come out this summer. So I'll leave it at that. I can also speak on our country level projects if that's of interest, but that's a little kind of overview or sneak peek on what's coming. Great, thanks a million, Elise. Um, Hello, Christine. Hi, Elisa, how are you? I'm good, hello to you from Scotland. We actually have a coffee with my little boy. That's perfect. It's we lunchtime. Your, 
very young participants. I just there. propose to say hello that I miss you all and I will join soon community engagement team. But I started new job, so I'm a little bit busy with new job. But Fair so enough. nice to see you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, um, do any of you have any questions for Elise? I mean, I have a couple, but I will let um, I will leave the floor open in case anyone has any questions. Like I was saying, I'm also practicing um, getting used to teams, so you can also shout out. Just raise your voice if I can't uh, see your raised. Carolyn, you have a question. Yeah, at least I would love to know what the criticism of Ground Truth Solutions was. Critique. Let's let's use a nicer word than criticism. A critique. <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm actually not leading on this specific brief, so I, I do not know um, what this uh, what this group has critiqued. Um, but I wrote an article for Group URD in the fall on this topic of um, how we partner and is our research extractive and meaningful for communities. And so just some points of reflection there are, you know, when we're partnering with data collection providers, how are, how transparent are we about the funding that we have? How much space do we provide them to give their input on the data collection methodologies? How much do they lead or do we dictate? Right. Um, so from a from that perspective of partnering, that's really important for us to think about. And that's part of our strategy for this year is improving on the partnering side. But in terms of also localizing our approach, and not kind of going in, extracting data, and then going up to the coordination level and saying, here's what we learned. How is that meaningful for people who participated? What is our role in going back to communities? And also being really self-critical about CWC, which is kind of, you know, in many ways decided as a, an important step in any type of data collection process. You need to go back to the people you spoke to and share back with them what you, what you learned. But to be honest, what the feedback we get is, yeah, we know exactly what we told you. We don't need you to tell it back to us. What are you doing um, to act on this data? And I think that's super fair. So I think it's important to also be able to come back to communities and say, okay, we've discussed this with humanitarians. Here's where things stand. Here's where there's potential for movement. Here's where they've said absolutely not. Nothing's going to change, but what is our responsibility? Ground truth to do that when I guess our mission has in many ways been pushing these voices at a at a higher level, I suppose, at different types of decision making levels. But we would also have a responsibility to go back to communities and say what's being done and also to think about if they could use our data. So could we, for instance, envision a project where we're working with I don't know, different groups that are already organized, a women's association or other political groups that are already organized in a camp, let's say, and feed into the work that they are already doing rather than come in with our preconceived questions and say these are like the important indicators for us to study, say what what information do you need to push forward the work that you're already doing in your community and what would be helpful? And then can we also pair that with the work that we're trying to do at more national and global coordination levels? So hope that answers, Carolyn, but that's just also personal reflections. So. Yeah, thanks, Elise. Um, anyone else have any questions to Elise or Carolyn following up on that? Um, this is very much in line with the, we just came from, um, uh, we as the Community Engagement Forum, um, uh, I was at the, the Global CCCM cluster meeting in Geneva a couple of weeks ago and um, so we organized two sessions there as the CE forum and one of them was on measuring participation and I spoke to you about this before Elise um, um, and you know you were highlighting but how do you um, uh, like how do you measure impact how do you um, 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 or this is what our discussions there led to um, um, you know how how do we measure the changes that the, whatever we collect in the say satisfaction survey, um, are there any changes made uh, to the programming after we receive this data? Um, um, and do you have any experience with that as Ground Truth Solution? Like, do you have any case studies or examples or anything on how it has actually led to changes in programming? 
Um, uh, anything inspiring that can be shared with us? Yeah, we. I mean, we get asked for good case studies all the time, and we should probably do a better job of highlighting those. I think it's hard, though, to draw a line right between the data that GTS collected and this specific change. There's a lot that's already ongoing, and I, from my projects in Burkina Faso, tend to get more feedback that, you know, this specific point that you made in your report led to more thinking on this topic on complaint feedback mechanisms or the way that we do two-way communication and fed into things that are already ongoing. So I don't want to say that, you know, I can draw a perfect link um, between things, but I think that we have plenty of anecdotal evidence of the research supporting ongoing thinking. But sorry, that's not a great answer. No, but you're right. Of course, it's um, it, it's more about contributing to impact rather than than uh, making such big changes. Um, um, but I also have another question to you and to the other um, um, practitioners here today. Um, one, like the session on, on measuring participation, it raised more questions than giving answers um, at the retreat. And one of the questions that we discussed was how uh, how do we record um, qualitative um, um, data on participation, on information sharing, complaints and feedback mechanism, um, you know, data that cannot be captured in surveys or focus group discussions even. Um, um, but we're, we're in the, the, the neighborhoods are in the camps all day and we have discussions and we see things and we're being told stories. Um, but how do we how how can we best record this? Um, uh, and um, um, and I suppose allow it to be analyzed and shared with donors, etc. And um, um, I don't know if anyone has any good examples or or tools or experiences with this. Um, it's about kind of um, showcasing um, um, participation and impact as well, I suppose, um, when it when it doesn't really fit into a survey. Or is everyone struggling with the same thing as I am? <laughs> If this is the case that, oh, sorry, Rose C, you have your hand up. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosie. I'm from uh, CDAC Network. Um, thanks for having me today. It's my first coffee morning. Um, maybe just to to come in, uh, Kristin, um, just in terms of what of your question, what would be the purpose of recording it? I'm not trying to trick you, just a genuine question. No, um, um, I think two things. So one, to... Um, uh, to uh, allow for different kinds of uh, um, input to um, to all the reporting that has to be done to donors and to headquarters. Um, um, so just, um, uh, um, I suppose, allow the community to kind of choose how they want to provide input and feedback, um, uh, whether it's on satisfaction or it's a complaint or a request or whatever. And also the second thing to kind of to showcase impact like we hear stories like uh, elisa saying we have uh, you know ad hoc like anecdotes etc um but they're not recorded as such yeah the reason i ask is because i think this is like an ongoing question isn't it it's about do we like if it's if we're recording it for our own sort of success stories then i guess it is you know it's case studies and there's lots of different ways but if we're looking at how to actually engage in kind of two-way dialogue then it's I suppose it's a different question, so that's why I asked. I think the second one that, you know, engaging in two-way communication is the most important. And what yeah. we need answers to, really. I don't know if you have any um, good examples. Um, you're from um, the CDAC network, right? I'm from CDAC network, yeah. If people mm -hmm. don't know CDAC, it's, um, we actually don't spell out our acronym intentionally anymore because it doesn't sound great, but it's uh, Communicating with Disaster Affected Communities. We're a network of, um, about 35 agencies, UN, INGO, uh, specialist communication agencies like GTS <laughs> and their media development organisations. Many of your organisations might be members. Um, I should be able to think of specific examples, shouldn't I, off the top of my head? But I think it's um, 
I'm sorry, just to, to come back to my question is only because we're, we're sort of looking at that at the moment around, um, you know, maybe we are sort of need to capture everything in data is actually simplifying the way that we have dialogue with people and, and sort of dis disabling, if you like, some of the more natural ways that people communicate. So um, I should have I should have thought about a, an example before I came in. But um, if you think about the ways that people often give feedback through of social media is obviously a lot that people are talking about, but through, sort of, you know, different at the market, through different conversations that they're having. Um, I think the, if, it's, if you're not too worried about recording it, then it's about making sure that it flows well. And one of the things that um, we're working on as a network is, is just trying to really understand how dialogue flows and how people's you know engage within their lives in the decisions that they make um and even though it can be complex sort of letting go a little bit of the control that we have over it and just listening which i know is a really sort of out of date word now so uh, uh, whilst someone else is saying something more coherent i'll have a think of an example <laughs> but thanks for having me today no thank you thank you for um narrowing it down to what we're really looking at here um if anyone else have any um, suggestions to this, just speak up. We're not that many here today, so we can just, um, you don't even have to put your hand up. Um, but Namir, you have a question here in the chat. Do you want to um, just um, ask it? Hello, Christine. I'm very Hi, sorry, but I, like it's, <laughs> it's very crazy. Here, so I couldn't speak, but Yes, uh, I, I like the idea of th this type of assessment or blog or like th the idea of how like it's important like for the uh, like the humanitarian aid recipients to to get an information or being transparent uh, to the aid receivers regarding funding and expansion on the humanitarian sector because we had a lot of discussions internally before regarding. What the things that we can explain? What the things that we can say? What the things that we cannot? So I think it's very important to have like a conversation about this because also like when previously we talk about the community-led activities, it's something that the people should know what the capabilities that we have, what the funding that we have, the resources, so they can decide based on that about the project that they want to implement. In the community led activities over. Yeah, I think that was for you, Elise, because you were mentioning the um, transparency around um, the finances that we use. Um, um, do you want to elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah. I was just typing out a response. Um, this is a contentious topic within GTS at the moment. So this piece is going to be a thought piece more than it is a, f a firm statement. And we'll bring in perspectives from uh, different aid organizations that have a different opinion about this to try to have a conversation on it. There's one camp within GTS and I'm sure elsewhere where there's this belief that, you know, aid organizations are fundraising tons of money and pouring that money into communities, people have a right to know where that money is going. If you look at our study in Haiti, that comes out really strongly, where Haitians are like, where did this money go? I didn't see any impact in my community, but you were here. Where did that money go? Um, and so on the one side, it's it's seen as incredibly important and to not do so is quote unquote, been called colonial, right? On the other side, um, there are people that say, you know, it's it's unrealistic to be able to share the budgets for a variety of reasons. Sometimes aid providers themselves don't have a full full eyes on the budget. Um, and I've heard comments such as, you know, if I shared what the project budget was in my community, my staff would be held hostage. So risks on that side as well. Um, as someone who's not a practitioner, I can't weigh in on on that and I'm hoping to bring together practitioners views on how practically speaking can we share information about a budget and what are the risks and what are the ways to get around those risks so that we really do move towards a world where we're more transparent about what's going on and people have a right to also point out and say you know where you've decided to put your money for this project isn't our priority 
and can can shift mm -hmm. the money where they see fit. Um, that's the idea. Um, um, I don't know if you're uh, if you're referring to internal discussions when you were working when we were in the same organization, Namir, with NRC. Um, because we have had a lot of discussions in NRC as well, um, especially around community-led projects. So, um, uh, you know, the specific um, uh, type of project process um, where the um, displaced population are the ones to identify the um, um, the problems or challenges that they want to focus on, and they also develop the solution. And it's based on resources and skills within the community themselves, but there is a budget um, um, that is that is being uh, handed over to um, you know representatives from this community, um, and they have to develop you know a BOQ and a project proposal. Uh, it could go to material, it could go to um, technical expertise, it could go to um, um, you know maintenance costs, whatever. Um, but around this, even we've had discussions on whether we should from the start be. Um, 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 be transparent on, on the amount that we have available for the projects. Um, so um, I understand that there's even more risks and discussions when it's um, around larger budgets and uh, programs rather than smaller projects. Um, anyone else have any questions for anyone here or inputs? Um, going through the chat. Um, thanks, Elise. I see that you shared the link there. Um, um, I can share it also on the um, on the forum website. Um, um, and this this is a link to the uh, vulnerabilities brief. Okay, brilliant accountabilities and vulnerabilities brief, I suppose. Um, and um, uh, Elise, will you be will you continue to share um, on the forum? When um, when you have any um, um, new updates and briefs, um, or should we go elsewhere to find it? Tell us where we can find you. Sorry, it cut out for me, but yes, I I can That's share it. on the forum whenever we have new stuff that comes out. Happy to. And if anyone right. on this call wants country specific reports, we just had a whole load come out. So feel free. I'll put my email in the chat if you want anything specific, and we can be in touch. Brilliant. Yeah, um, and you're also uh, on the forum, so they can ask there as well in case um, 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 in case it's, it's relevant to others as well that um, might be shy to ask or um, uh, or to contact you in person. Um, um, there was one more thing I wanted to uh, mention as well from the from the CCCM retreat, um, the other session that the community engagement forum was facilitating um, together with the um, uh, with the participation in displacement working group under the CCM cluster. Um, it was on community led projects, so a bit related to the, the previous topic. Um, and it was a continuation of the um, session that we had in May here together um, um, as a forum where we identified you know, the different challenges and barriers to planning and implementing community-led projects. Um, 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 uh, uh, sorry, I was just reading the chat while I'm talking, sorry. Um, um, if, in the, during the different kind of phases of planning and implementing the community-led projects. So what we did at the retreat was to um, um, identify, okay, how do we address these challenges? So Halas, we've we looked at the challenges. Now let's find the solutions. And there was some really good work done in trying to identify practical tips and and solutions to each of these um, barriers. And I'll share that as well on the forum. Um, and when we asked the group there, what do you want you know, from now on? How do you want to go forward? They said that what they really want is case studies and examples of community led projects and like the process that they have used and the tools, and they want more examples of specific tools. So more examples of SOPs, more examples of MOUs with the with local authorities or with the communities themselves, etc. So specific tools and specific examples, um, which we can definitely um, collect. And if any of you have 
examples that you want to share of any of this, please do directly with me or on the forum. And if there's anything else that or other um, ways you want me to take this forward through the forum, please also let me know if you feel like there's another discussion necessary, please let me know. Um, um, uh, I've asked them. Um, um, there's um, there is um, uh, Twig, a, a technical working group in Yemen, um, under the CCM cluster, who has done a lot of work on community-led projects. Um, so I've asked Walid from that Twig um, to come to our next um, community coffee and chat, um, uh, and you know, um, be up for a lot of questions directed at him and give us some examples of these tools and, and um, types of of um, projects as well. So I'll, ad I'll advertise that um, closer to the date. Um, but if you have yeah, any any wishes or see any gaps in information or, or tools that you think that we can share at the forum, please do let me know or just share directly as well if you have access to them. Sorry for my voice. Um, um, Hi, Kristen. Uh, it's Carolyn again. Carolyn. I'm going to ask a question. Um, you know, I as I've been giving uh, in my current deployment AAP sessions, you know, I've used the words community engage, the phrase community engagement and the word participation. And I've started asking people, well, what do you see as the difference between the two? So could could I hear some thoughts from people in this forum uh, right now? What what they see is the difference between community engagement and participation. What I thought, I thought participation was deeper. And then as I talk to people, they say, oh, no, no, community engagement is deeper. So what the heck is it? What, which, what is which and which is what and why the two? Anyone? Hi, it's, it's yes, Sarah. Sarah. Um, uh, Carolyn and I like to have conversations, so not just to speak over Sarah from NORCAP. Um, I think that it, it, sometimes it's semantics, no? And isn't it a bit like if you're a protection person, you're like protection is more important than community engagement and accountability. And if you're an AAP person, you're like, well, AAP community engagement is more important than, you know, overrides protection. Um, might be one of my, I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, but yeah, I mean, or, or maybe the technical answer of participation is a mechanism for delivering community engagement, which is the mechanisms of which you deliver accountability to effective people. But kind of semantics, maybe. I mean, I, I guess when you're like in Gaziantep talking to people who are working at, at field level, they probably don't need to bother themselves with the Geneva level semantics about what delivers what for who or, or am I being just a bit flippant? <laughs> I, I agree Sarah except that you know in various uh, documents of my agency I mean they're seeing those terms as well so it's you know there's it just gets confusing and as you're trying to teach a deeper I mean I, it doesn't really matter so that's what I end up saying is what matters is the the depth of the engagement or participation, whatever you say. But it's just, we have uh, this tendency in our field, we have so many different names and acronyms and words we use. And I think that does dilute the, you know, some of the, I won't say impact, because again, it, it, it dilutes our ability to, oh, I don't know, the word is, it, it, uh, oh, Rosie, chime in, because I'm having trouble finishing my sentence. <coughs> I also have a three-year-old on my knee, so um, he, although he does like the limelight, I won't share my camera. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we talk about this obviously a lot as well, and I think there are, it depends who you talk to, right, and what they mean, but we, we're part of um, the Grand Bargain Participation Revolution, um, which many of you um, may also attend. If you don't, I would encourage you to get involved. We're also uh, seems to be a very siloed uh, group and I think it's open so um, if you want to know more if you want me to link you in let me know but uh, that's you know that's a group and we our point on the participation revolution is that it's really focused on you know it's, it's usually quite notional and at that in particular is is 
tends to focus sort of not too not with not too much cynicism it focuses on participating people into our system um as opposed to sort of uh, facilitating participation amongst people and communication um per se so i think it does depend on um who you're talking about i think usually when people talk about community engagement it has like a string of um project like it's projectized right so there's community engagement when you think about it people think about the things that you could put in a proposal that would demonstrate you're doing community engagement whereas participation should be something a bit more broad but yeah often localization inclusion engagement participation people are it, it really is overcomplicated when actually it's pretty you know it, it's quite straightforward if we could let go so yeah it does i agree with you and but it's also very sensitive right the, if you ever bring up terminology people go mad so people don't want to go back into that conversation um yeah i mean, i'm just going to jump in with one more point which sometimes i think that because of people get so obsessed with names for things and acronyms that sometimes because it's got a different name or acronym or or whatever that they can be like oh that's somebody else's job like and so sometimes you can it's like you know you can pass it off because your job is community engagement not participation or the other way around for example much first opinion yeah i think it's um um i think it is an important uh conversation so we at least, so if it is important for the people in the field, then I, I suppose it's important. So if people are being confused um, um, about what is what, it's good to be able to give them an answer. But I think the different organizations have very different um, um, terminologies as well. And what is um, sensitive in some organizations and not sensitive in other organizations. Um, um, but um, 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 yeah, does anyone else want to um, share anything on that? Because it's really interesting to hear how how it's being discussed in the different organizations and different um, uh, spheres. Um, um, not Carolyn, Sarah, you you also had a point on um, on CFM. Um, Oh, yeah, no, that was related to the CCCM um, meeting and just whether when you were there, uh, whether you heard about the Zeit manager, just because uh, we're partly funding one of the positions. So I was interested whether it was there. Sorry, that's my horrific doorbell. <laughs> no, I didn't. I missed the session. Um, there were a lot of parallel sessions, so I did not uh, go to the Zeit management with the Z um, um, presentation. Um, um, do you want to um, share with people what that is? Not to put you on the spot, Sarah, but do you want to share with people what that is? Uh, sorry, my doorbell just went just as I came to do that. And um, do you know what? I think that maybe I shouldn't be put on the spot now because I won't be the best person to do it. But I think it would be interesting to invite somebody from the CCCM cluster um, mm -hmm. and or IOM to this group to kind of share it all with you. Um, yeah. And anybody who works for NRC, <laughs> um, coincidentally, I also saw that their innovation pool, their innovation funding was out and had like a real great focus on CFMs. And I think if anybody's at a country level, this might be an opportunity. I don't know whether this group could be to link up some of the initiative there with the innovation stuff rolling out CFMs. Um, that's just me thinking there. Over. Um, yes, we can definitely invite someone from um, um, from the cluster um, that can uh, speak a bit more on this uh, um, uh, CFM tools from the site management uh, tool. Um, um, I know I very little Nicholas. about this. Nick Veit, uh, uh, is Nick still in the meeting? He was on the uh, he is. people. And maybe he has some thoughts on that because he's done so much with IOM and CCM. Now here's that's putting somebody on the spot. Exactly. No, I know he's there. I see. I see him. Nico, are you there? Yeah, that's clearly putting someone on the spot. Sorry, <laughs> but I, I will ask because I have some background noise. Can, can you repeat the question? Actually, sorry for that. But 
Yeah. Um, it was about the this site management um, um tool, I think it is. Okay. Or yeah. yeah, specifically Correct. for CFM. Correct. Uh well, I don't know if there is someone from IOM actually because it's IOM tool uh that maybe could take the lead on that. If not, I can I can give a, the a brief idea of what I know about the tool. Uh, yeah, please do. Okay. If there is no one from IOM. Basically, I think the, the tool starts, if I'm not wrong, in Bangladesh actually and they start using it as a way to refer um, refugees to different services um, and also to monitor sites you know the, uh, the different areas of uh, Cox Bazar actually uh, and now the, the the tools start to expand to many other contexts and and actually using that way basically they do a site monitoring that's not further than a Kobo kind of um, form and then when they identify some services that are not provide or there are gaps in the service provide, the systems can provide, you know, can refer to a specific organizations that are providing services. You know, they can link it to the service map. Basically, that's what the tool does is like identify gaps and make it available in a visual way, um, way for, for other partners to respond. And then when a partner receives an email saying like, this is the gap, this is the need of assistance of this specific individual of this site, uh, they can, you know, do the follow up with the specifications that do the referral, you know, and and I would say that's a work in progress. Actually, now they are trying to to expand the scope of the tool. But like I said, this is actually I own tool. Then I don't know if it's my, uh, yeah, my place to to actually go on deeper on that. Yeah, I think it would be good to invite. I mean, I mean, potentially you could invite Danny um, or somebody from them to present his in a number of like five or six countries now, I think. Yeah, and I think I know that they are trying to expand it also to Ukraine now. Yeah. OK, Ingrid, jump in. Don't be so polite. Hi, Christian. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, yeah, my signal is quite uh, intermittent, but I'm from IOM and Nicholas quite captured how the site uh, platform is working. So we are currently also having it uh, in Ukraine uh, as a work in progress. And if we want to know more, we can definitely contact uh, Danny Coyle. I think he also presented in the past uh, Global CCM retreat. Uh, the good thing with this uh, Zeit manager is that when we started this in Bangladesh, uh, there was a collective uh, support and buy-in from uh, example from within the cloud so uh, IOM, UNHCR, DRC, uh, partners, agencies who were involved in site management support so adapted this platform and this tool. And this was also, uh, I think Lana, if Lana was still there during the time in Bangladesh, so it was also um, discussed at the intersector level. So the, um, it's really uh, site monitoring, uh, the data collection and referral, and then being able to have this update at real time. So there is a dashboard. I think our colleagues shared the link to this um, uh, Zite Manager uh, website where you can see like the dashboard and where referrals uh, can be monitored and escalated uh, to within the cluster or through the inter cluster or intersectoral um, collaboration and, and meetings. And then it goes back. So it's like going back to the loop, uh, uh, back to the uh, the camp and to the 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 data to the site managers uh, themselves to be able to follow up or to know what action has been taken. So yeah, just quickly on that one, but I think it would be interesting um, if we invite Danny and then he can also address um, questions like how it has grown. And in Ukraine, we are still in process uh, of adapting it as well. Thank you. Yeah, Lana. I totally, I totally agree with with, with uh, Ingrid. And uh, while I was in, uh, in the coordination of SNSC sector in Cox Bazar, it was really interesting too. And we could adapt some of the indicators from the CFP. And I didn't know that it has its name, uh, site management. Uh, actually, by, by that time, but. Um, we could adapt and use like the minimum uh, standards from CCCM 
and to use so we we could adapt the minimum standards uh, grounded to to Cox's Bazar and use some of the, the indicators that we had in the site management. For me, and for our coordination perspective, uh, it is a really interesting tool that we can like follow all the the, the cycle of uh, um, not not exactly participation but, but feedback, complaining feedback mechanism, and uh, the 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 beneficiary or the the population in need. It's it like they complain and we go all the way around in a way it, that from a coordination perspective, it's really good to follow and to monitor. I would definitely recommend us to receive, uh, I don't know, to have someone from IOM that is developing the, the this tool because it's a little bit more comprehensive and to, sh to share also the dashboards. The only complaint that I have from the from the, the this tool, uh, it's uh, sometimes the, the 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 time that we have that we receive as coordinators, uh, that we receive um, the numbers or the um, because sometimes it's not like every month or it 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 takes a little bit longer than the time that we monitor. But uh, thinking about the coordination structure, it was a really excellent tool. And the, from my perspective, it was the, one of the best ones that I have seen uh, to monitor and to follow up uh, complaint and feedback mechanisms from, from site, uh, from, from people on the, on the camp management level, per, per se. Okay, great. Action point. Um, um, I'll get hold of Danny Coyle, was it? And in IOM and ask him to um, give us a, a follow-on presentation how this can be useful for us. Um, um, yeah, did, do, you, do you remember if it had a, a, any kind of layer on whether the, um, what, the, the person who made the complaints or, or, or uh, input or feedback? Um, if they got back to them and told them, you know, um, um, this is what has been done. Yes. Okay. No, no, they, they told me they have like, and the site that uh, someone just, I think it was Nicholas that just shared, there is like the cycle. So it's the collection, uh, the whole process of the information, the refers to, to all the sectors or all the, the services uh, providers, and then the response to to the person it's really a complete cycle it's a really yeah. it's really interesting it's really amazing how to how iom and i can also uh, only say about the, the the bangladesh perspective of course yeah. but it's it's huge like the numbers of um um complaints are huge and it's not just uh, SMSD sector, but uh, wash sector, all the sectors in Bangladesh. So more than five or uh, more than seven or eight sectors, something like that. And it's all there is a whole com um, a whole cycle that it's can it starts with the complaint and it goes uh, up to the the feedback to the person to the the ones that were complained. So it's really amazing the work uh, that IOM and all the partners are doing there. And across the world, I guess, <laughs> but uh, because it's it, for the first time, I could see like the whole cycle of a complaint and feedback mechanisms going from the complaint itself until the response to the to the beneficiary or to the population in need. Great, perfect. Three people already shared his email address with me, so I I have no excuse now. We'll definitely follow up on this. Um, and. Um, I Yes. I think I think uh, for, from the for, like um, combining the two co discussions that we were having about participation or engagement itself and about complaining feedback me mechanism because this is a complaining feedback mechanism like a simple like that it's not about participation at of course or engagement let's say of course there is a participation of the the population because they have to do the complaint they they are they are. They are there, and when when they see the responses, for sure they they participate more. But it's not exactly a community lead project or anything related to that. But um, 
At the same time, on the other hand, and thinking about uh, engagement of the people, the population, if we have a complaint and feedback me mechanism that really works, maybe we can also go and and it make it easy next steps of uh, participation and community engagement itself, Agreed. you know? Yeah, it can facilitate um, participation for sure um, uh, and lead to changes in programming, not just to addressing it's also something we yeah discussed in our session on on measuring community engagement and participation in CFM. Do we, um, um, you know, there's the addressing the complaint. So say there is like a wash issue, you know, and we go through that whole cycle and and get back to the person saying, you know, this is has been addressed. Are you satisfied with this? But then there's also, um, um, um the question around are we changing our programming based on the, um. On, on the complaints that we receive. Why was there a complaint in the first place? Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I, I know that is like, uh, and then I, I will add another layer of, of complexity, but uh, thinking about the population, and, and we also could use this in Africa, in Libya, for example, because there is a lot of people that moving uh, up from, from South Africa and other countries in Africa, of course, but up to, to Libya to cross and go to Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. But, and this is the same movement that we see here in Latin America, that people come from South America up to Central America to go to the US. Um, it, I know that is a little, really complex, but if we could try to use some uh, kind of uh, complaining feedback mechanisms here around the, the, the camp management, not the camp management, the, the, the al alojamientos temporales, <laughs> I don't remember in English the, the term, but um, uh, if we could use those kind of feedback, complaining feedback mechanisms, maybe the people that is on the move coming from the south to the north, they could also like kind of uh, communicate between uh, among themselves. And then uh, the complaints that they, they, they wanted are like going first, uh, mm -hmm. It helps the the others that are coming after them. I don't know. This is something that I was yeah. thinking about. And how could we humanitarians in movements like these not not uh, uh, not camps as we have in Bangladesh? There are like uh, camps that are not on move, but camps that are on move or alojamientos temporales that that receive people that is just like crossing, passing by. How could the complaining feedback me mechanism? from someone that is just passing by for three, four days, could support the other ones that are coming. And then and we the connect centers. these people. And it's in transit centers, and yeah. thank you very much, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, yes, I think uh, we, we have um, a lot of questions for Danny and um, some very, uh, um, I don't know, there's a lot of deep questions and interesting uh, points on on between the link between like a functioning CFM and participation, but it goes back to terminology as well, I suppose. Um, can't really serve, solve the or answer the terminology question now, Carolyn. But I, thanks for all the input in the chat um, um, to how you and your organizations um, uh, define it. Um, um, I'm being conscious of the time because I know I've said in when advertising these sessions it's half an hour to 45 minutes so we've gone a bit above but thanks to everyone who's still with us um, it's hard to stop talking about community engagement for me anyway um, um, but if you have any other questions or, or um, comments now um, while we're still here please go ahead um, speak up or put it in the chat if not, um, 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 we have um, no specific um, um, no specific date for our next um, um, kind of technical webinar or workshop, and like the one we did on community-led project yet. But I will share the feedback um, uh, from the two sessions at the retreat, and then when we plan our next technical webinar I will uh, of course let all of you know um, 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 we have an advisory board meeting on Monday so we'll continue talking about uh, potential topics then 
um, with the board members and potential contributors, etc. Um, um, you know, we're getting some interesting ideas now um, around um, com complaints and feedback mechanisms and measuring participation, etc. Um, and uh, we will also aim to have one on um, on uh, uh, ABA, so area-based approaches, um, community engagement kind of in area-based approaches, um, you know, under CCCM um, around maybe September, October. So um, that's a bit into the future. Um, and except for that, we have um, our next community coffee and chat again. It's a, this is a monthly initiative, so um, we plan it for the last Thursday of every month. So the next one will be the last Thursday of July, and I'll make sure to advertise it again um, in time for everyone to join. But um, it's great to have all your inputs in the chat and 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 um, have actual chats and um, uh, verbal chats with you. So thanks everyone for participating and joining and and sharing. So see you soon. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Hi Louis. Thanks. Hi, Thank you. you. Nice to Hi. see you. Were you there the whole time? Yes, I was here. I was here. Ah, how's the baby? Yeah, everything is fine. He's growing. Good, good, good. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks for joining. Hmm? Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, Christine. Bye, Lana. Thanks, million. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.